Latest post-debate analysis following that electric debate between those seven candidates on the stage in Simi Valley, California, the GOP presidential contenders going head to head. Now I want to bring in Dr. Mark Caleb Smith. Uh, he teaches courses in American politics as well as constitutional law over at Cedarville University over in Ohio. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, Mark. We sure do appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Let's jump right into this. I really want to talk winners and losers. Uh, who were they last night? Uh, you know, I think in terms of winners, uh, I think maybe Ron DeSantis did a little bit better last night than he has previously. Uh, I thought he was much more effective when he's talking about bottom line sorts of issues in Florida. And when he did interrupt, he was able to be heard. And I think he was generally more forceful, which is probably good for him. Uh, I think Doug Burgum actually handled himself very well. I'm not under any illusion that he's going to win this thing, but he was very substantive. He has a good deal of experience. And I think he had his priorities in order when he was talking about things that a president's going to have to deal with, uh, at least over the next four years. When you think about losers, I mean, I, I really try my best not to be cynical, uh, but I think the loser overall was the Republican Party. Uh, I thought the format was really poor. The moderators did not function very well. They lost control of the debate. There's a lot of crosstalk. Um, and it was almost a, a circus-like atmosphere in all the worst ways for, for a long time. And then when you add in the absence of President Trump, uh, the front runner just simply choosing not to be there, I think it really deflated the proceedings. Absolutely, definitely crowded on that stage with seven people there. Who do you think uh, may make it, may not make it to the next round? Of course, we're still working out uh, the, the latest on, on that and uh, working out to find out uh, what those restrictions might be. But I imagine that wherever it goes next, it's going to be a lot tighter and things are going to start to button up. Yeah, I hope that's the case. I mean, I, I understand that everybody thinks they're going to catch fire. Everyone's sort of hope, uh, holding out hope that they're going to have a surge and get momentum and be able to rise in the polls. Uh, but I think so far it's fairly obvious that Doug Burgum, uh, that Mike Pence, maybe even Tim Scott, and probably Chris Christie, unless his polling starts to improve, they need to think hard about their role in the race right now. Uh, they need to think about clearing the stage so that other people who are in a better position in terms of polling uh, can consolidate the race and really start to decide who's going to take on Mr. Trump. Um, <clears throat> I think all those candidates have their own version of how that might happen, but it's hard for me to see how someone might go from two, three, four, five percent in the polls uh, into, into the nominee. And so I hope that the stage clears and we get three or four people at the most. The sooner that happens, I think the better for the party and probably the better for the country. Why don't we talk about the elephant not in the room last night as well. You did mention briefly there uh, Mr. Trump over in Michigan last night as he was out there speaking with uh, some auto workers as the union strike continues to uh, loom overhead. Um, what did we hear from uh, Mr. Trump just last night and uh, what do you hope to, uh, to see perhaps from him that we aren't seeing uh, since he's absent on the debate stage? You know, I, I think Trump is running this campaign essentially like he's an incumbent, uh, and in many ways he is. Uh, his other party members really aren't willing to go after him all that directly. Uh, last night in the debate, no one talked about his indictments. The moderators didn't talk about his indictments or his legal jeopardy or the possibility that he has business fraud on his hands now. Um, and so his legal problems are still swirling around him. It's hard to know how those are going to affect the race. However, uh, Mr. Trump is just sort of gliding above all of it. So I think it was smart for him politically to go to Detroit. Uh, he's certainly trying to build his brand, uh, continue to build his brand among white uh, middle class or blue collar voters. And that's really going to be his source of support when he moves forward. So I think it's good politics for him in some ways to make the choice that he did. However, I, I would still say it's not good for the country when the front runner for a nomination just simply decides not to show up. Uh, I think it's better for the American people to see him on the stage with his rivals, defending himself, uh, putting himself out there. Uh, I hope he chooses to do that sooner or later, but from a purely strategic perspective, I can see why he won't. Well, and if you saw that recent Meet the Press interview uh, with Mr. Trump uh, as the new moderator took over there uh, on NBC, uh, he was asked a number of questions about how he's going to run the country in the future. And uh, Mr. Trump really doesn't appear to be hitting on the issues as much. And I don't know if you can comment on that. 
Yeah. <sighs> You know, when you listen to him, it sounds like he's really plugged into sort of a grievance approach to politics right now. Uh, he certainly feels a lot of resentment over what happened in 2020. Uh, he thinks he was mistreated by the press as well as the Department of Justice uh, and other entities while he was president. And that's really fueling his campaign in a way. And yeah, I would normally say that uh, you know by distracting from issues and by focusing on other things, that's really a recipe for disaster for a candidate. Uh, but I think Mr. Trump is probably doing the right thing politically. I, you know, just even listening to the debate last night, it didn't really feel like policy was driving the debate. It was really more about other kinds of issues, people just trying to score points. It was a little bit silly in a way. And so to focus on policy and to get into detailed policy briefs and things like that, it just doesn't feel like that's the mood of the electorate at the moment. And so our politics right now is drifting in a cultural direction, not so much in a policy direction. As we get a little bit closer to the actual election itself, though, do you expect that voters may be tuning in a little bit more closely to those policy issues? Of course, a couple come to mind. I mean, we have the government shutdown now looming over our head. And of course, the crisis at the U.S. border still on the minds of many Americans. At what point does policy, uh, do you believe, or will it in this next election uh, really become the prime focus? I think it's a great question, and I think anyone who pretends they know the answer to that question is just fooling themselves. Um, our politics over the last eight to ten years have been very unpredictable, uh, driven by external events, driven by emotion, and so I'm not necessarily convinced that there's going to be a drift back toward policy as we get closer. Uh, I think it probably will focus even more on personalities and more on uh, the characteristics of the candidates, their age, their suitability for office, uh, how relatable they are. Now, if the economy continues to struggle and if the middle class continues to get squeezed through high interest rates and other things, then I do think the economy will step forward as a major issue. Uh, but if the economy smooths out at all, then I would expect these cultural kinds of issues to become dominant again. But we'll see. I think it's a great question, uh, and I'm not sure we have a great answer as of yet. I know it's still early, but if there was a way to potentially narrow down two GOP contenders that you would like to see perhaps yeah. in a final debate uh, right before the primary, who do you think uh, might be the two top uh, for that? You know, I think, uh, and I'm certainly uh, ready to be proven wrong, uh, I think that Nikki Haley is probably in the best position to move forward out of this field. Uh, Ron DeSantis has really struggled to get traction recently, uh, and I don't know if that's going to change based on last night. I think Nikki Haley <clears throat> is getting the attention of donors. For people who want to see an alternative to President Trump, I think she's emerging as the, as the most likely alternative. I would like to see her and Donald Trump go after each other in a real debate, a substantive debate over uh, the future of the country. I think that would be the best for the party, and it would ultimately be best for the United States to see sort of a substantive argument between two people with strong disagreements. I think that would certainly be an interesting matchup. And of course, uh, maybe a Haley-Biden debate, a Haley-Trump debate yeah. could also yep. uh, uh, be very interesting as well. A uh, lot to look forward to in this next election cycle, not very far out. I know we're less than 400 days uh, away That's now right. uh, from that. Uh, meanwhile, Dr. Mark Caleb Smith over there at Cedarville University. Anything we didn't ask you? Anything you'd like to add? Uh, I think it's really interesting that it, the setting last night in the Reagan Library, Reagan sort of hovered over that debate to some extent, uh, but it was interesting to me how much the party has really moved past Ronald Reagan uh, and his ideology. You know, right now the Republican Party is just sort of, it's finding its way and its voice. Uh, it's entering into a new phase of politics. As a political scientist, it's interesting to watch. All right, Dr. Mark Caleb, thanks so much there uh, for joining us here on Live Now from Fox. Thank you. All right, folks.